Hello. All right. Is this better? Yes. All right. Perfect. So we're going to go ahead and, and get started with the final review. This is for PSC 1121 uh, Physical Science with Dr. Brickner. Um, there is another professor that teaches this class, so if you're here from that other professor, this is going to be more geared towards our class. I don't know if um, this content will be the same or not, so you're welcome to stay. If not, whatever. <laughs> um, uh, I passed out at the end of the tables their little evaluation sheets. Um, we're not going to worry about those until the end, see if more people show up or whatever. And we'll pass those out, and those are just evaluations on how the study union went in general, and I'll give you more information about that at the end. All right. So, final review. So, preparing for the final. Uh, these are just a few things that I think will help, so check out the final SI review session. Congratulations, you're here. Um, listen to the podcast on iTunes U. Uh, this is one of the things that I think you can use while you're studying. You have three, about three, four days to study before the review, uh, the final. So um, this, it's good to go back and listen to some of the old information that we went over three months ago that probably most likely has slipped your mind. You haven't really thought about it. So it's good to go back, get a refresher, and this also helps um, when you are going through your notes. Sometimes when you're taking notes in class, you're, list, you're missing a lot of information um, because you're so busy writing and you're not uh, focusing on what he's saying. So you can go back and listen to some of the things and you might catch something that you didn't catch before. So again, review notes. You just go over your notes, highlight, make, uh, make note cards. Uh, look at the textbook. You know, he doesn't teach from the textbook, but it helps if uh, maybe there's some things that is confusing to you. You can go back, look at pictures in the book, maybe read a little blurb, see if you can get some more information that can help you understand the content. And also check out the exam blurbs on web courses. I can show that to you later if you don't know what that is, but you can go on uh, web courses, he has an exam blurb section where you can go back and he gave you all of your old exam printouts and it tells you what you got wrong, what you got right, and the blurbs just kind of give you an idea of what the question was about. So say you got something wrong on question number 12 on exam two, you can go back and look and see what it was about and be like, all right, so I need to look up that kind of stuff. All right, so preparing for the final. Uh, tips to make it through finals week. Sleep, eat, take breaks when you need it. Um, Definitely, I'm one of those big believers that I'm not going to pull an all-nighter. My sleep is much more important, and I'm not going to learn it at 2 a.m. I know that it's just get your rest. You're not going to uh, work as well on three hours of sleep. Eat well, take breaks. They say to take breaks every couple of hours. So work for two hours, maybe take a 30-minute break. Work another two hours, 30-minute break. If you overload yourself, you're just losing, you're just losing stuff. It's not working out. Um, if, when you take breaks, you could, uh, you could do a hobby. I like to crochet, so I like to take a moment, go be a grandma for a moment, and maybe make a little sweater or something. Um, do physical activity. They say physical activity is a good way to get your brain and your blood pumping. Um, I don't really do that, so I don't know how that works or not, but you can try it. And then, when is the exam? Just to make sure you guys know it my great little transitions and all that. So it's Friday at 10 a.m., not at noon, 10 a.m. So be there at 10 a.m. Perfect. All right, so again, what you need, your clicker, calculator, pink scantron, and your brain. Please make sure you have your brain for that. All right, so now onto the content. Uh, so we basically started off talking about velocity. So velocity is a speed and a direction. So there is a specific direction it's going north, east, south, west. Uh, there is figure 2.4 to look at. Um, also, I, I don't want to, I want to make sure we can get through the slides. So don't write down everything that is on the slides. Write down specific things. That way you can go back. This is being recorded. So you can go back and I can give you guys the links 
onto YouTube and you can see stuff if you missed anything. But don't worry about having to write everything down. Just listen, make specific notes if you need them. All right. Um, velocity is a meters per second. And the change in velocity is just V, oh, I think it's supposed to be V2 minus V1, final minus initial. Oops, it's okay. You get the idea. So you have your initial, your final speed. Think of it like a number line. Where's the difference? Going the other way. All right, so velocity change in velocity with triangle vectors, so that's when we use the Pythagorean theorem, a squared plus b squared equals c squared, so v1 squared plus v2 squared equals delta v squared. And that was with the questions, um, like a bounce, basketball bouncing off the backboard. So you have a direction going north, you have, so you're driving north, and then you gotta drive east, it's a right triangle, so you gotta find, um, your delta V, and the delta V, it's in that like combination of, so if you have a north and an east, your direction is now northeast. All right, so then we started talking about acceleration. So this is our speed acquisition rate. There are a couple different ways you can find uh, acceleration, either way, it's all the same formula, it's just flipping around the letters, doing some algebra to get what you need. And again, it depends on what numbers are being given, so use whatever qu equation that you have. If you only remember this one particular equation, but it works, don't worry about it, just use it. And this is a meters per second squared. So veloc uh, a velocity was a meter per second, this is meters per second squared. Check out figure 215. Thank you. So free fall. This is acceleration due to gravity. Uh, again, a meters per second squared. Um, so this is like when something is just falling. It's accelerating downward. Gravity is 9.8 meters per second. And so with that meters per second, that would mean that it's a velocity. So sometimes um, you can see a question where it's 9.8 meters per second or 9.8 meters per second squared. Make sure you just know the difference. Uh, you can find free fall where delta V is gravity, negative gravity because it's going down, minus uh, delta T, so your change in time. So again, change in speed during free fall. And this, uh, he had the example in class with the free money demonstration when he dropped it and he had uh, a young lady come down and try to grab it. Gravity. So Isaac Newton, he kind of, he basically solidified the idea of gravity. Um, so uh, the way that he looked at it, there was centripetal acceleration of the moon, and the moon is on a free fall accelerated path. So obviously the moon is not falling, but it is just being orbited around us. Uh, gravity always depends on the mass and the distance of the object. It is always 9.8 meters per second. If you, he would specify on a, uh, a question, okay, we are on a different planet, we are in an alternate universe, whatever, that this is your new gravity. But if we are talking about a, a question on Earth and if he doesn't specify that we're somewhere else, it's always 9.8 meters per second. Um, this kind of ties in with the law of universal, well, not kind of, but it does tie in with the law of universal gravitation, and that's with that big F G equals big G M1 times M2 over R squared, and we see these kind of equations uh, throughout the semester, very similar equations. And remember that G, that big G, 
is a conversion factor for Newton, so all that does is just tie all those numbers together just to make it a Newton. So uh, then Newton, we learn about his laws. So Newton's first law of motion, every object has a constant state of motion unless there is an unbalanced force acting upon it. So if I were to uh, throw a bowling ball and, it was, and it's rolling, if there was no friction to, um, to that opposing force on it, on the bowling ball, it would just keep going forever until it hits something. It hits a wall, it hits a pin, it just slows down because maybe I don't throw it fast enough. Uh, this is figure 219 for the bus example, so you can go back in the book, check that out. Um, ties in with the law of inertia by Galileo. There's no horizontal gravity, so we did this in class, this little example, where say you're throwing a ball, and it goes up and over, up and over, and once it reaches the top, there's no more up here. You've gone as far as you can go, so if you were to take a snapshot at that one instant, it would just be purely horizontal, and that's up at the apogee, the highest point of the arch. So once it hits that highest point, it starts to go back over and down, down and over. And that's figure 217. So Newton's second law, this is where we talked about unbalanced forces with F net, so more push, more acceleration, more mass, less acceleration. So if I have a ball, a baseball, and I just kind of daintily throw it, it's not gonna go far. If I chuck it, it's gonna go far. So if I have more push, it's gonna be more acceleration, more mass, less acceleration. So a baseball, throw a baseball, and then throw a boulder. How, which one's gonna go farther. So you get F equals MA, um, which is also F equals MV over T, A equals F over M, so just different variations of F equals MA. Again, depending on what question you have, just use what you know, use what you need. Um, what can be interpreted from the second law is force, obviously, stopping time, and momentum. So these are, this is just kind of getting the ideas of all these three different things. So we're talking about force, so we're talking about a Newton. This is a metric unit of force. A Newton is a kilogram meter per second squared. So that's if you just break it down. If you're doing an equation, you, if you still get a little confused, did I do the numbers correctly? Check the units. If you, the units equal kilogram meters per second squared, then you're fine. If it does not, go back and make it to where, um, that, make sure that is your unit. It's a derived unit, so that means that um, you can't just measure it. There's no physical object that measures force, so it's just kind of derived. Um, the, di the directionality of acceleration is equal to the directionality of force and vice versa, so if your force is going left, your acceleration is going left. If your force is going right, your acceleration is going right. 
so we're going the same direction. Newton's third law. So this is every action has an equal and opposite reaction. Um, so these are our third law pairs. We did the example with the skateboarders pushing off each other. I believe we did that this semester. So long ago, can't remember. Um, so the third law of pairs is what gives us impulse and momentum. And that's with figure 2.22, and I believe that's the one with the astronaut and the um, out in space pushing off of a satellite of some sort. So we have um, the impulse equation, F delta T equals delta P, and delta P momentum is mass times velocity. And uh, third law pairs can have different speeds, but their momentum will always showed like, oh, they have different speeds and all that, and they have different masses, but they're still proportional to each other so that the momentum is always equal. So definitely go back in your notes and um, check that out while you are studying. momentum, P equals MV, uh, so that unit is a kilogram meter per second, so uh, a newton was kilogram meters per second squared, so this is just that one second. Is a dynamical quantity, so uh, he showed this example, so the equal and the opposite, so F1 delta T and negative F2 delta T, and negative just kind of like if you think about directionality, if you're pushing off, one is going left, one's going right, think of it like a number line. So he broke it down, well F is mass times acceleration, and then still equal to each other. And then acceleration is velocity over time, so break that down even more, so you can cancel out that time with that time, and that time with that time. And then that leaves you with MV equals MV, so that's where we get the um, third law pairs, that's where we get momentum, all that good stuff. So centripetal force and acceleration. The direction is constantly changing, so, and the speed is constant. And so that's where we had the circle, the radius. Uh, the, the, your change is always parallel with the radius. And so those are your equations, FC uh, equals M, V squared over R, and then acceleration is the same equation, just without the mass. And, um, so your force and your acceleration are always parallel with the radius. And then your velocity is constant, the direction, your velocity is always changing. So if it were to go a little, it's just slightly. If you were just to uh, move it just a little tiny sliver to the right, it would still be slowly changing. So just make note that what is parallel, what is um, perpendicular. So this was one of the, qu the questions we had in class, 
which turn has a greater centripetal acceleration. So the, it, sometimes it can be confusing to just think about it and try it. I know when I took the class, I had, I was confused with just trying to visualize it, but the way that I made it work for me was just to plug in some numbers. So you have one turn that's bigger than the other. So there's another one, and then there's your beautiful, perfect path. Sorry that it is cut off on that side. But there on that side, you can see how beautiful it is. So just plug in your numbers. So uh, acceleration, A equals V squared over R. And let's say we just have a velocity of 12. And so the velocity doesn't change at all throughout this path. So with the big one, you have A equals 12 squared over 60, you get 2.4. And then with the smaller, you get 12 squared over 40, which equals 3.6. So, uh, so which turn has the greater centripetal acceleration? The smaller one does. So just plug in the numbers. That is the best way that I tried to make sense of it when I was learning the content. Also, you can visualize, imagine you're driving your car and think of you're on university and you're going on the 417 and that's a real sharp turn. And so say you're like, nah, I'm not gonna slow down. I'm gonna keep going my same speed. Well, you're gonna feel that force of your car just trying to make sure it doesn't fly off. Whereas if you're going around a bigger turn, you're just continuing. You can keep the same speed, it's just fine. But if you're going down a a uh, smaller turn, you need a smaller speed so you don't kill yourself. So that's a way to visualize it. All right, we talked about weight force. So that's just the weight force of the path. The, the weight force and the path of a falling object are parallel. As a result, the speed is increasing. So that's just how much the weight force of my phone dropping on the counter. It has a mass and with gravity it pushed it down so it had a certain amount of force when it hit the table. And then, so there was a little Pepsi can dropping, it had a weight and so it had some force. W equals mg. And remember that we used later on in class after we had stopped talking about F equals ma and force and all that, we did an equation where we needed to use W equals mg, but we all forgot about it because we just didn't think about it. So just always keep in mind these older equations, uh, you can use them in later content. Energy. Energy can be compared to momentum. So you can read that on page 68 and 69, make a note of that, go back in the book check it out. Energy is measured in joules, and a joule is kilogram meter squared per second squared, which is equal to a newton meter. So there's that little extra meter there. It's a dynamical quantity. It encodes changing speed. It has no direction. So your energy isn't going left or right. It's just you have energy. It, and it always depends on our trajectory path. measured in segments, I forgot that little part. So when we first started talking about energy, remember he did the basketball comparison of it falling, or even if you just have the chart, you always measure it, this is within this meter, and this meter, and this meter, so little segments. So different types of energy, you have kinetic energy, it's the energy of motion, Ke equals one half mv squared, you have potential energy, so energy at rest. GPE equals MGH or MG delta Y. 
H is just a height, Y is a measurement. So it could, you could see it either way. I just say MGH, it rolls off the tongue better. I like it. And then there's work, which is the change in kinetic energy. So delta KE, and that is equal to, so work, big W, or it could be delta KE, is equal to F parallel, delta S, delta S, delta X, delta Y, delta R, delta Z, those are all just uh, used for measuring something, so how many meters was it? And then F parallel, if you were given a question on this, it's just, you're not gonna be given, this is your normal force, and this is your parallel, and this is your perpendicular force, you're just gonna be given a force. Those were the three different types of energies that we talked about with movement, at least. And so how we said measured in segments. So we've used this chart before in class. So you have, say you're dropping something from a tree and it is five meters tall. So before you drop it at that five meters, your potential energy is at its max because it hasn't moved yet, you're just holding on to it. It has a lot of potential to it has a lot of potential to fall and break, I don't know. Um, kinetic energy is zero because it has not moved at all. And so as the kinetic energy goes down, the potential energy, well, as the ball goes down, the kinetic energy increases, the potential energy decreases. And um, when you do the math for it, you can see that the numbers are the same on each side of the chart of the potential or the kinetic energy, and so if you're only given the information for maybe potential energy, D, uh, MGH, you can just plug those numbers in and then just flip them over, put them in the chart accordingly. Remember, the total energy is just, it all added up, and your total energy does not change. You can't lose, you can't just lose energy in that system. So we've seen that before, use it in class. When you're working with, if you have a question like this on the exam, I think the chart is the best way to just get, to work everything out. If you, it takes like a minute or two to do it, but I think it's worth it. It helps a lot. I like it. All right, and we talked about power just a little smidge. And so that was the rate of production, use, or dissipation of energy. We had the example of um, the plane landing. So check that for your notes, uh, from your notes. Uh, power is one joule per second, or a watt. And that's delta E, the change in your energy over the change in time. And so this would be like the power that uses in our house, we use in our house. So how many watts does this microwave use? And all that. We only briefly talked about this in class, so just go back in your notes and see what was given. Or go back to iTunes U. Definitely go back to that and listen. And then we got on to heat. So we talked about this for quite a bit. So James Prescott Joule determined G GPE could be converted to a specific amount of heat and water. So this is the thermodynamic equivalence of work. And we talked about in class. So basically think of when you're stirring uh, like a cup of water, if it's cooler, when you stir it, it'll start to heat up because of the kinetic energy, potential energy, remember they're related. And we use Q equals MC delta T. If you get confused, can't remember that, I like to say MCAT, that's what they say in chemistry classes and it, it helps me remember it. We talked about E pluribus unum, and from many there is one, so there are many particles, but you have one system, one system that's heating up. Uh, we have specific heat, C, so how easy it is to heat something up. And remember, the 
bigger the number your C is, the harder it is to heat it up. So liquid water, uh, the specific heat is 1, and ice is 0.5. So it's easier to heat up ice than it is to heat up uh, liquid water. And then calories, heating up 1 gram of H2O by 1 degree Celsius. This is also, it could be 1 degree Kelvin. Remember, they, the, there's no big conversion between going from Celsius to Kelvin. It's just adding a number, 273 to be exact. And then one calorie is equal to 4.184 joules, 1,000 calories, so those are your little calories, is equal to one food calorie. So heat transport, there are three different modes, so conduction, which is a physical contact. You're conducting energy on your seat right now. If you put hot water into a mug, the mu mug's going to heat up, so sometimes you have some hot coffee, and when you go to pick up the mug, sometimes it's real hot. Conduction, so you heat it up. Heat flows in cooler objects easily, so it's easier for that hot coffee to warm up your mug, then that mug to cool off your coffee. Uh, conduction heat rises. The opposite is insulation. So my coffee mug is insulating the heat into the coffee so it doesn't get cold. Convection is bulk motion. So this is something like thunderstorms. If conduction is not rapid, you have bulk motion. So convection and conduction are very similar, but conduction is something that's happening very quickly. So um, a stove heating up, that's happening real quick, the stove top. A convection, so like a convection oven, maybe it's a little slower, but it's moving the air around. It's a bulk motion, that air is flowing around together to make your food cook quicker. And then you have radiation, which is when we talk about the electromagnetic uh, spectrum. And it moves momentum and energy by photons of light across space time. So this is ultraviolet radiation. We have UV rays, which give you uh, skin cancer if you aren't careful. It's not skin cancer, you just get real bad sunburn. Three different kinds, conduction, convection, and radiation. So heat, again, uh, we typically use the Kelvin scale in the class. We So 273 Kelvin to this many degrees, well, this many Kelvin, not degrees. So Kelvin is not based on water, but it's just molecules in general. So they have this theory that at absolute zero, everything would stop, all time, all molecules would stop because it's that cold. And we, they don't really test that because that could be real bad if we stopped everything. But that's the idea. We have melting and freezing points, so this is just of water. That's usually what we use if we're not using water, he'll specify. So uh, you can freeze something or start melting it at 273 degrees Kelvin or, or uh, zero degrees Celsius. The boiling or condensing, so you can heat it up to vapor or you can make the vapor condense back into water, same thing is 373 Kelvin or 100 degrees Celsius. So 
same thing. There's no big conversions with Kelvin and Celsius, just that 273. There's figure 420 for you to look at. Um, and then we have the latent heat of fusion and vaporization. So um, this is where bonds are being broken. So when we work on a heat melt heat uh, equation, which I have one on here, um, you have to heat it up and then you have to melt it. So when you're melting it, you're making those solid molecules that are being held together, the bonds are broken. So they're a little bit, they're moving a little bit better. And then when you heat it up and then vaporize it, you're breaking the bonds again. So the molecules are just flying around. They are, they're not attached to each other anymore. Uh, with the fusion or vaporization, we use Q equals ML. So latent heat fusion, latent heat vaporization, all that good stuff. So a heat melt heat. So let's say we have a 30 gram block of ice at a temperature of 260 Kelvin. So how much energy does it take to heat up, heat up that block of ice to 393 Kelvin? So we use Q equals MC delta T, Q equals ML. So first process, we gotta heat it up. So we have uh, 13, there's a difference from 260 to 273. There's 13 Kelvin. Our C is 0.5 for ice, and then our mass will always be 30. So that equals to 195 calories. And I put the units there so you can see if you need to cancel it out, if you wanna do that later, if you were confused what unit I'll be using that. So you've heated it up, now you have to break the bond from the solid to go to a liquid. So 30 grams times our latent heat of fusion, 80 calories per gram. So that equals 2,400 calories. Heat it up again. And so this is when we're going from 273 to 373. You can't go straight to your final temperature because you can't just go from liquid to the vapor. You have to heat up that liquid completely. So that's just 100 degree, uh, 100 Kelvin difference. Our specific heat is just one for ice, not ice, uh, water. And then again, 30 degree, 30 grams. So you've heated it up, it's now at 373. And so you need to break those bonds. So 30, grams times our latent heat of vaporization. I believe that's it. I, uh, yeah, I believe that's it. I was a little confused as to what the number was. If it's not that, just double check it, but that should be it. If not, you're getting the math right, so just make sure you know the math. So that equals to 16,200 calories. And so now you have that vapor and you need to just heat it up 20 more Kelvin. So your specific heat is now 44 still 30 grams of ice or now vapor. And then we want to know how much. You just add it all up. So that is when you are heating, melting, heating, vaporizing, and he could just give you a simple uh, question, maybe going from liquid to vapor or ice to liquid, or he could give you a big one. So just make sure you know the process of it. You have to, you can't go straight from a block of ice to vapor. You have to do everything in between. He then started talking about waves. So waves transport energy and momentum across space time. So there's a nice little wave. They are not easily localized. You can't really see waves unless they are a, me a mechanical wave. You don't see the light waves hitting us, hitting our eyeballs. Waves display diffraction. This diffraction, it generates wavelets at barriers 
and edges. There are, there's the wave equation. Remember, they're the same thing. D equals lambda F is when we're using an electromagnetic wave. So when we're talking about light waves, X-ray, uh, UV, radi uh, radio waves, and infrared. And the, or V equals lambda F, that is your mechanical wave. You would have an actual speed given to you. And then C, speed of light, three times 10 to the eight meters per second. So meters per second, that's the velocity. Basics of speed. So here's another wave. I'm just talking about the parts of the wave. So the period is the time. So this whole wave could be our period. The, of course, in temporal interval. So it's like we're on a little number line. We have our wavelength, so that's from crest to crest, trough to trough. Our amplitude from our baseline, so that so think of it like the sea level. So here's sea level, our amplitude would be to the very tip of the crest or the very tip of the trough. Frequency F, so that's the inverse, one over P and it's measured in hertz, so hertz, megahertz, terahertz, hertz. Interference, we have constructive interference, so a crest meets up with another crest, and they make one big wave. And remember that it could be two crests or two troughs, so it could be one dip plus another dip would be one giant dip. So destructive would be we have one crest meeting up with an opposite, a trough, and it just gives us a flat line. So constructive, you're building something, construction. Destructive, you're destroying something, you're making it flat. We have the electromagnetic spectrum. So here's Weeb. So your radio waves, they're your biggest waves. They have the bigger amplitude, a uh, smaller wavelength. So think, the, I believe these bars should be for the most part equal to each other. So you can see between the radio waves and the infrared, there's more waves in the infrared than there are in the radio. There's, the wavelength is getting smaller. You're getting more waves in there. Visible light, so that's our Roy G. Biv. All the light that you can see, visible. Ultraviolet, so that's what we're getting from the sun, the UV rays, and X-rays. Remember, that the radio and infrared, these waves are, because the amplitude of these waves, they're so much bigger, they don't really do anything other than like work with technology. But uh, we don't, these, these waves don't really hurt us, whereas ultraviolet and x-ray, those can go through our skin, you can get bad sunburns if you are a doctor and if you uh, do too many x-rays, you have to stop because that could hurt you. Visible light, well, who knows, maybe that could kill us. So, it's just your spectrum. Uh, if you can't remember the order of them, remember that Roy G. Biv, first one's red, it's right next to the infrared. Uh, Biv, violet's at the very end, right next to your ultraviolet. systems, these are our springs, and we also talked about it with other things as well, but we'll get into that later. So springs, the force law of a spring depends on the displacement from the equilibrium. 
figure 5.2 has the full cycle. Uh, with springs, you have restoring forces. So if you have a, um, like a, a coil in your car that's holding up the, maybe lowering your car or whatever. So you have that coil in there. And if it's crunched down because of the weight of the car, if it were, if the car were to go, or like if you took it out, that coil is going to spring out. It has a lot of force. It wants to go back to its equilibrium. It wants to be normal. If you were to pull it out, you can't really do that with a car coil, but you can do it with other kind of springs. If you were to pull it out, it wants to go back to normal. We used F equals negative KX, talking about the force of springs. SPE, spring potential energy, one half KX squared for the energy in a spring. Remember that K is a proportionality constant, so um, it's different for every spring. So a lot of times we solve for K when uh, we have a question, we've had homework questions and all that, where we have to use F equals negative KX. Most of the time you're trying to find K because that's different for every spring, but if you were using the same spring in every problem, then the K would be the same for that spring. So each spring has its own K, but it's different. With the TAs and the rope, the coil, so you have your fundamental fundamental frequency is half of a lambda. So with your first excited state, in the book it says first overtone, same thing. It's your full wavelength. So one full wavelength is your crest and your trough, your trough and your crest. It's that full wave is your lambda. So the first one is just half of one. And then your second one, I didn't know how to put this, but it's a wavelength and a half of a wavelength. So here's one there, and then there's the other, other half. And um, there are, Dr. B has videos on YouTube for, to if so if you wanna go back and listen to what he said about the demonstration, you can go back and look at it. We talked about the Doppler effect. So that's a stationary system and that's when um, the police are checking if you are speeding. So if when they're standing there and you hear the pitch increasing, the frequency is increasing, it's moving towards you. When the source, so if you're standing there and the car is going away from you, the pitch decreases, the frequency decrease, decreases, so pitch means frequency. So it's used by the police to catch speeders. Uh, he gave us this big equation, F return over F sin. We never used it, but it could be an example on maybe one of the equation matching. He didn't put it on the last exam, so I'm real upset about that. I was hoping he would, but maybe it could be on the final. So just be aware of that equation. But what we do use is beats, and that's when you're just trying to find the difference in the frequencies. So it's F2 minus F1, or big minus little. Um, just finding the difference of those frequencies. And remember, that would be like in the example with the tuning fork, where he hit one where he had the metal clamp lower and the other one didn't have one, so he hit them both at the same time and you could hear they started doing like a wave, there was a wave in the sound, it went in and out, so that would be an example of how, what beats is. All right, so electricity. So what keeps the nucleus together, this was a question given to us in class, it's a third force, neither electromagnetic or gravitational. It's a strong nuclear force. Uh, static wing, it's a charging mechanism. It's 
we have the electron theory of charge. He just briefly talked about this, but he uh, referred it to figure 6.4, so go back in the book and check that out. Listen to Eisen's view, see what he said about it. So important people. This is, we talked about people all semester, but when we got into this section, we had a lot of important people that did a lot of important things. So J.J. Thompson, he had his cathode ray. Rutherford, he did the experiments with the alpha particles and the gold foil. Van de Graaff, he had the atom smasher. That's where we had the demonstration in class with uh, the wig, but didn't really work, so Dr. P put the little packing peanuts on top of it, and when the static electricity went through it, they kind of flew away, and then when he touched the, the smaller one to it, had a cool little lightning bolt. Coulomb, so he did the, the torsion balance, or uh, Coulomb interaction. Faraday talked about field lines. Bohr talked about the quantum theory of hydrogen. A uh, good way to think about that, quantum theory is a boring thing. Uh -huh. De Broglie, uh, he talked about particles as waves. So those are our important people, and we'll go back to them in the next slide. So the cathode ray. Um, J.J. Thompson did this with the parallel plates. So that's basically what it looked like. So you had a negative plate and a positive plate, and these are just like a beam of electrons where they were expecting it just to go right through, but it bent down. So this verified that electrons are being negative. Opposites attract, the like repel, so electrons being negative. They don't wanna be near that negative part, the negative plate, so they bent down, but they do like that positive plate, so they're gonna, either way they wanna be near it, so they stay that way. Rutherford. He did the alpha particle experiment with the gold sheet. It sh the showed backscattering, so some of the particles went right through, but some of the other ones went back. So it showed electrical repulsion. And basically what he found through all of his experiments was that the nucleus is positively charged. The ratio of nucleus to atom is one to 100,000. So the nucleus is very small. We, he talked about uh, using the basketball as an example. So the basketball would be our nucleus and it went all the way out to the Starbucks and the uh, airport. So backscattering found that the nucleus was positive. So a coulomb is the metric unit that we use for charge. It's equivalent to 6.24 times 10 to the 18 protons. We use it with the, well, we didn't really use this equation. It's just used for concept. But Q equals NE. Q being our quantum charge. N being the number of particles. And E being our electric charge. So is it an uh, electron, is it negative, is it a proton, is it positive? Coulomb, the scientist, did the torsion balance. So that was where he had the two, Dr. B said it was basically like bowling balls, just big uh, spheres on the end of a wire, and they showed pairwise interaction 
uh, more charge, more force. It showed uh, attraction and repulsion. We call this the Coulomb interaction. And that's where we have the equation uh, F equals K P1 P2 over R squared. And remember how I mentioned that we've seen this equation before with the F for gravitational, uh, law of gravitational, blah, blah, that one. So where it had G equals M1, M2 over uh, R squared, R squared. I can't remember the other one. But yeah, so a lot of these things can be tied in with each other. Make a note of that. So with the Coulomb interaction, we used the linear charge array where we had a, a linear array of particles. So red being positive, blue being negative, but it really doesn't matter. Just know that they're opposite of each other. So um, we're going to do an example of this where we have a nearest neighbor force of 130 newtons, and we want to know what the total, the net force is, the total, with the this proton being our target. So I've mentioned before in the last review, and if you've come to any SI sessions, that I like to make it like a number line, where, where our focus is, that's our zero on the number line. And so we have one, negative one, negative two, negative three. And so those one, negative one, negative two, negative three can be our R squared down at the bottom. So this is just the direction that I usually do it in. I just finish everything up that's on one side if one's smaller. So we are at R equals one. So 130, our nearest neighbor force, over one squared, which is still one. So we have a leftward force of 130 because these are like uh, atom, uh, like particles, so a proton and a proton this proton is going to push this proton away. Think of the ones that aren't our focus. This is the only one that's moving. These are all going to stay in their spot on the number line, and this is going to be what's moving. So this proton does not want this proton, so it's going to push it away 130 newtons. So on to the next one. Uh, it's still the same distance, just negative one, but if you do negative one squared, you still get positive. So it doesn't really matter if you put the negative or not. It's just, I do it, makes sense with me. So 130 over one squared, that is again 130. And because this is an opposite particle, it's a electron, it's going to pull that proton towards it. So while that first proton, proton that we use that's pushing our target away, that electron right next to it wants it, so it's going to pull it as well. Then next, 130 over 2 squared, remember we used R squared, so whatever we are on the number line, just square that, so 130 divided by 4, it's a uh, electron, so it wants that proton, so it's going to go to the left again and it's going to the left at 32.5 newtons. And then our last one, it's uh, three away, so three squared, 130 over nine. Because this is a proton, it does not want that proton. While it is farther away, it's still going to push this proton to the right at 14.4 newtons. And so um, the way, when you do it like this, you're not automatically saying, oh, because of this and this, it's positive and negative. Because you made the number line and you know that it's either pushing or pulling, 
anything to the left of a number line, any number line you ever use, anything to the left of that is always negative. Anything to the right is always positive. So most of these uh, forces are pulling or pushing to the left. So all of these are negative numbers. Add them all up, so negative 130 plus negative 130 plus negative 32.5 plus a positive 14.4 gives us a net force of 200, negative uh, 278.1 newtons. Are there any questions with this? This was one of the big problems that we did. Um, there could be some confusion with what direction it goes, but this, does this kind of make sense by putting it that way? I saw a head nod, maybe I'll go back for a little bit. I saw a head nod, so just one is all I need. So there's a good possibility that this could be um, an example, not example, but this could be one of our questions on the exam. Um, the way I would think about it is what was our previous clicker questions? Those will probably be our clicker questions on the final or anything that gave us a lot of trouble. So uh, nearest neighbor, heat melt heat. Um, I can't think of any of the previous exams. So field lines, uh, so that's when we have our electric field, the uh, intrinsic property of any charge or array. And remember this is just one single charge, so you could have one proton and it has the field lines going out of it. And the density of the field lines indicate, indicate the relative strength of the field, so if there are more lines, it is a stronger force field. If there are less, it's not as strong. Uh, ele the electric fields are, it's an abstraction of force, so it's a Newton per Coulomb. And another concept equation that we had was F equals QE, so force equals Q, that is charge, We talked about electrostatic potential, which is our voltage. So that's a joule per coulomb. And another conceptual question, electrostatic potential energy, Q, uh, Q times V, so the charge times your voltage. So these are our dipoles when you have an elect, uh, a negative and a positive. Those are attracted to each other. So we showed in class that the lines would kind of combine together. Remember that with the positive, the field lines are going out, and with a negative, they're going in. So that's kind of how it works. They just poof right into each other. Whereas if you have a positive and a positive or a negative and a negative, they can get close to each other, but they never actually connect like these two dots. So dipoles, di means two, so two poles, either positive, positive, or negative, negative, or two together. force versus field, this was a chart given to us. So we've seen this before. A force is basically talking about multiple charges. So a two together, two, three, four, whatever. It's multiple charges. And then in a field is just that one. So the Coulomb interaction versus the Coulomb field, you can see it's just one charge. Uh, the force uh, works with F delta S, whereas a field 
work with the energy, E delta S, and um, with the field you have the oscillation of energy, which that can be shown through photons. Remember those photons are particles of light. And uh, you have these in your notes. If you need to, go back to I can see them. Voltage, electrostatic potential energy, EPE, is equal to uh, the work to create potential over your charge moved, or W over Q. Again, concept equation never really used, but uh, you can, if you might get a question on this, it could be a, multi uh, a matching. Voltage, work, and charge are related. So, voltage, V, work, W, Q, they're related. They're all in an equation together. A volt is one joule per coulomb, and it's the atomic scale energy unit is the electro electron volt, so that EV, and that's, I believe, batteries use EV. I have a battery here. Nope. This is a nine volt. Don't lick these, they hurt. But volts, EV. The lowest energy level that is possible is with one of uh, hydrogen's electrons is negative 13.6 electron volts. So that's as low as we can get. Capacitors. So this is where we talked about parallel plates and batteries. So parallel plates, they are two metal plates with an insulator in between. Uh, the stored energy in a capacitor is proportional to E squared and the volume between the plates. So volume between and E squared. When you connect to a capacitor to a new device, current flows and work is done. Batteries, it's basically the same thing except it's just circular and they have a fluid like that. And then there's a wire that connects to the plate so they do work. And these are oscillating systems. So the way to think about an oscillating system and think of it like a spring. If you have a coil of any sort and it moves back and forth, whatever, it doesn't, the spring doesn't explode and go everywhere. It stays within itself. So the way that I think of oscillating systems is it's within itself. So if you have, um, when he did the example in class with the battery and the uh, copper wire and he wrapped it around the nail, but the inner, the energy, the, it did not, electricity, it did not just spring out of the wire. It was connected from one tip to the other. It didn't just explode with energy. Uh, we use a farad. It's the unit of capacitance, so it's equal to a one amp second per volt, or a coulomb volt, or a coulomb squared joule. They're all the same, just used differently, but that's a farad for capacitance. So we talked about hydrogen wavelength. Hydrogen has a limited set of colors. They're not thermal, but it's a quantum effect. So we have your H alpha, H beta, H gamma, and H delta. So it's a quantum, they're specific. We had the uh, chart given to us in class where H alpha has a certain wavelength and H beta has a certain wavelength. They have a certain wave number, one, two, three, four, five, whatever. You can't go in between those. H alpha will always be right here, H beta will always be right there. So the 
Bohr model is where we get that quantum theory of the, um, so like boop, 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 something happening in an electron. Um, so the quantum mechanical model of an atom is based on considering bound electrons at scanning waves at various energy levels. So you have your energy levels and you have an electron at one of them. It emits a photon when it jumps down. So boop, little light, little, little photon. Um, and how I said uh, hydrogen, uh, H alpha is at a specific uh, wave number, wavelength. H beta is specific, gamma, delta specific. So this electron can't jump from here to like here in the middle or here to right here. It has those specific lines, so it has to fall right on the line. Um, when it jumps from higher to lower, it's releasing energy, so it's letting off that photon. It can jump from lower to higher, but it does not release a photon uh, because it require it's taking in energy, so it's more absorbing energy at that time to get up to the higher levels. And this gets, like, this is the guts of the Balmer formula. So that one over lambda equals the Rydberg constant times uh, one over two squared minus one over n squared. So n would be that wave number, two, three, four, five, six, whatever. Uh, Rydberg constant, that's always given, that's a constant. So it doesn't change when we're talking about hydrogen. If we are talking about any other element other than hydrogen, he would tell you. But remember that um, with the one over two squared, that's specific to hydrogen. They always go to two, to the second level. So it could go from three to two, four to two, five to two, but they always go back to the second level. And that's with hydrogen. Broglie wave theory, so this is when particles are acting as waves, and that's, they're just kind of um, like floating around the nucleus in a wave-like pattern. Um, it's constructive interference, so they, uh, the electrons, they wave around the nucleus, they wave around their orbit, so that they're constantly construct constructively interfering. Um, if you don't have that constructive interference, then they're not going to be doing anything. So you have to have that constructive interference. Um, we use Planck's constant, and this is the constant that rules the world. It's basically in everything that we do, like through physics. Uh, H equals 6.63 times 10 to the negative, negative 34 joules per second. Um, and that's when we use the lambda equals H over mv, or H over C because MV is momentum. Planck's constant, again, a constant, and constants are usually given to us on exams, on the front sheet. So Max Planck, he is the one that came up with the Planck's constant. And he had the quantum theory, like a theoretical idea of quantum mechanics. Um, he had the only assumption of specific quantized oscillation would fit the data with uh, ex like hot objects. So this would be like the surface of the sun. That's where he's getting this idea. Go back in the iTunes U and listen to what Dr. B is saying about this. I can't word it very scientifically because the quantum theory, it's a very confusing theory, but definitely go back and listen to that and hear what he's saying about it. Go back in your notes if you, took, if you know you took good notes. Um, but Max Planck, he used the equation E equals HF, so energy equals his constant times F, which is frequency, little f is frequency. Um, this is known as a classical. It's a basic idea that can be reconstructed and other scientists, other researchers, they can use this idea and kind of convert it into uh, what they 
need with what they're researching. So Einstein related this to photons from hydrogen, so he took this whole theory and he's like, ah, well, it can be, this can work for photons as well. And he also used the E equals HF. So it's a classic theory. Go back in your uh, notes or iTunes U and definitely listen to that. Get some good information from that. Uh, we talked about a baseball versus an electron. So wavelengths and diffraction tell us why baseball waves are not easy to observe and electron waves are observable. So think about if you're at a baseball game and you watch someone hit a baseball. It, when the baseball flies up in the air, it's not waving. It's just kind of doing half of a wavelength because it just goes up and then it goes down. Um, whereas that same distance where that baseball went, that they only had half a wavelength, whereas if you had an electron, a little tiny electron baseball bat hit that, you'll see it's so small, has so many different, has such a larger wavelength, um, or it has a smaller wavelength, but it goes a lot, there's so many. So large objects are classical objects. <coughs> oh, it's happening again. Large objects are classical, so they are different from electrons with wavelengths because we can observe those. Oops. So you can observe those. You can't observe the wavelength. It's the wavelength and um, the wavelength and the frequency and all that. And you could see that the number, it just, they didn't work out with the baseball. And uh, the examples, 8.5a and 8.5b is what is doing the math of that, the baseball versus an electron. So definitely go back and check that out. We started talking about the periodic table. This uh, Mendeleev, he was the one that started the periodic table. <coughs> Originally based on properties of the elements. So remember the old school periodic table that they showed, it was more like it was going more horizontal than in the columns that we have now. And that's just because that nothing was known yet of protons, neutrons, and electrons. It just had the basic information of, oh, these are their properties. They all kind of relate in a way, and maybe he could see, oh, there's a certain amount of this, so he arranged them in his own way, and then later we changed them. Now we have the chemical properties are in the columns. So at the very end, you have your noble gases. They all are monoatomic. They don't share anything. They do their own thing because they have their full outer shell complete, whereas you have alkali metals, which is your very first row, and then you have your alkali earth metals, which is your second row, and each row has a certain properties that uh, e the row has, the column has, sorry. So alkali metals have one electron, alkali earth metals have two, halogens have seven, Sorry, I know too much about chemistry. So periodic table, when we would see an element, so gold, for example, you have your atomic number. So this is your number of protons. And if you look at a periodic table, you see it goes one to two, three, four, five, six, and so on. Uh, this, it's arranged with the number of protons. Just to a little reminder, you cannot change the number of protons. It's not possible, but if you were to, so say you're like, oh no, it's gold has 68 protons. No, it doesn't. That's a completely different element. So the protons are specific to each element, whereas the atomic weight it has all the protons and the neutrons. So your neutrons can change and your electrons can change. But your neutrons, you so you know you have 79 protons, just subtract 79 from 196, and that's how many neutrons you have. Um, electrons, if you need to know the difference with that, you'll know if it's neutral, positive, or negative. If it's neutral, it has the same amount. If it's positive, then it has more protons than electrons. Negative, more electrons than protons. Bond 
bonding. So we have ionic, which gives or takes electrons. So we have a element, and then this other element takes it. So they don't, we showed this in class, they don't touch, they just kind of take and stay near each other. Covalent is when they're actually sharing. So, uh, for example, if we're looking at these two, say this is uh, sodium and chlorine. So NaCl, that's table salt, Na has one to give and chlorine needs one. So chlorine's just gonna take that one. Whereas with covalent, say you have H2O, hydrogen, well, hold or covalent, but for the most part, they are sharing. So the hydrogen has that one proton, not this one proton, well, one electron in its outer shell. So you need two of them and oxygen needs two. So they just kind of share together. That could also, let's see, I don't know. I can't think of any off the top of my head, but covalent is when one doesn't take it, they just use it together. They're holding hands right here because they're friends. Uh, there's more information on this on uh, page 218. <coughs> the outermost orbitals are the ones that bond. So whatever is on the inside, you don't worry about those. It's how many, however many are left out there. So NaCl, sodium Na has one out there. Cl, chlorine has seven out there and needs one more. Uh, the outermost shells, they're not as tightly bound to the nucleus. <clears throat> and there's that octet rule. So once you have eight in your outer shell, the um, element is like, okay, it's fine. I'm done. I don't need any more. And it just holds it closer. And with each electron added, it just gets tighter and tighter to the nucleus. Um, atoms prefer to be in lower energy state levels, so that's why they bond. Um, if there is an element, like there are a lot of elements that are extremely unstable, so like chlorine by itself, chlorine gas is very bad, it can kill you. So that is an unstable element, it reacts, it is bad. Oxygen, if you just have oxygen by itself, oxygen is very reactive and can explode, so it, once it bonded to something else though, with hydrogen, we have water, water is good for you, water is great. So they wanna bond. Electronegativity, so this is the grabbiness of the element. So we saw, let's see, we have the chart, this would, uh, Dr. D mentioned, this is going to be given to you on the exam, so we have fluorine, which is the grabbiest, it has the highest uh, highest electronegativity number. It wants to take, it wants to take everything it can get. So it's gonna take a lot easier than these. They're not as grabby. So he said, so think of, I think cesium is this one right here. So these two have the same number, but this, it's not as grabby, so it's willing to give away that one electron that it has, where fluorine is like, I want that, give it to me. So think of like selfish children. Some of uh, some are like, oh, I don't care, and others are like, give me, when they're only children, right? So, ionic bonds, that's your 1.7 and above, polar covalent, 0.5 to 1.7, and covalent is zero to 0.5. Um, double check with, I know the homework that was just given to us, um, it had an example where you, one of the questions where you had to find the difference, and I know one of the answers was 0.5, so I would double check and see what it said on that homework, if it was covalent or polar covalent, because I, I know when it's 1.7, that is automatically ionic, but I'm not sure if zero to 1.5, if like 1.5 is considered covalent or polar covalent, so um, double check with that one question in the homework and see what it says, what it said the answer was. So you can go from that. And then kind of like the last few things we started talking about in class was water. 
So water has a polar structure. You have an oxygen, two hydrogen bonded together, and it has that, um, it's more negative than it is positive. So hydrogens are positive, whereas ox oxygen <coughs> is negative. So it shows, it just goes in that direction. Uh, water is a universal solvent, so it will dissolve anything that is also polar. So um, water does not dissolve in oil because oil is nonpolar. Uh, salt can dissolve into water because salt is polar. So like dissolves like. You can read about that on page 279. Liquid water is more dense than solid water, so that's why your ice cubes, if you put some ice in your water, your ice cubes float because they're not as dense. And he showed you a chart in class that like it changes at different temperatures, so go back to ice cream with you and check that out. <coughs> and then lipids. So lipids are long hydrocarbon chains, so all that means Hydrocarbon, pretty big word, it's just hydrogen and carbon. But one side is polar, the other side is nonpolar, so your polar side here, and all these, this entire chain is nonpolar. So uh, this would be an example with soap. Soap as a lipid, uh, this side, the head right here, is what's going to attach with the water. Whereas this side, if you have a bunch of these together, they're going to attach to whatever grease. So if you're washing a plate and you know there's some grease on there, <coughs> the soap is going to attach to the, the nonpolar side is going to attach to the lipid, the grease, and then the uh, polar side goes, washes right off with the water. Figure 11.5, check that out. Uh, lipid bilayer, so that was just when there's two, so think of this, my wrist as like the uh, the polar side, and these are the nonpolar, and they just kind of link together. And there's a bunch of them. That's like our skin. Again, nonpolar and attaches to grease, polar and cling to water. And uh, hydrogen bonding, so uh, definitely look at the your notes or ITMCU4 when uh, he talked about hydrogen bonding, how all that works. And then he gave us that real big word that I'm not even going to attempt to read that, but DPPC, uh, that's used to reduce the surface tension to allow premature babies to breathe. So that's a lipid, he talked about that. Uh, <coughs> but yeah, so. Dia, Dika, la, 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 that. So look up, look up that. So now go study. Before you leave, let me just tell you, get some rest, eat well, take a break. I passed out before you get up. Please let me finish speaking. Um, they, I passed out evaluations at the end of each table. Some of them um, you might need to pass down to the last one or so. But these are just uh, the evaluations to know how study union went. At the very top, it asks for your session number. We're session number 39, so just fill that in. This just lets us know how study union went for you, if it ran smoothly and whatnot. Um, if you have any further questions, I I'm here for about another 15 minutes, so if you have questions, we can talk about that. Um, I wanna thank you guys for a good semester. This is actually my last review session ever, so Good luck with everything. Good luck on your final study. Again, sleep. That's my favorite way to study is to sleep. So get some rest. Eat well. Get some vitamin B. That's brain food. Some fish. Take breaks. Oh, and don't stress. You got this. Um, I will post the link onto the Facebook page. It was given to me in an email, so I will post that um, in a little bit.
you guys can go on and it was recorded, so um, you'll be able to go and rewatch it if you need to. Right, and then whenever you're done, you can just leave the evaluation just on the table and I'll pick it up.